So good evening, everyone, and welcome to a special guest webinar by Physicians Association for Nutrition Israel. We are a part of an international organization of professionals, which are dietitians, physicians, and other health professions, aiming to reduce diet-related diseases, improve lives, and rethink health. One of the ways we choose to do that is by joining hands and getting updated in evidence-based knowledge on how to prevent and treat disease by healthy lifestyle and especially healthy nutrition. So I'm very excited and honored to present Professor Shira Zelber Sagi, who will give a lecture on preventive nutrition for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Shira is a clinical dietitian, epidemiologist, and researcher, and head of the School of Public Health in the University of Haifa. Shira is a dietitian for 22 years at the Liver Care Unit at Tel Aviv Medical Center. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So uh, Shira, thank you very much for being thank with you. us. Thank you so much, Roni. And I'm, I'm so excited uh, to give the talk in this really uh, distinguished forum. And thank you everyone for, for joining us. Um, so, I, I chose to talk about preventive nutrition because this, this is what I believe in, in prevention, not only in, in taking care of a disease, uh, but also in preventing it. And so I'm going to have a lot of focus in my talk on that topic. And I've actually started to study non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, when I was an MA student and then a PhD student. And so I studied this topic for the past 23 years. Um, and the reason that I fell in love with this topic is its strong uh, relationship with nutrition and lifestyle. And it's, it's a very optimistic disease also because it is reversible in every stage, almost every stage. So um, I'm, I'm really happy again for the opportunity to, to have discussed my favorite topic uh, with you. So actually um the the uh importance of nafeld is, is growing in the past decades and it is clearly the most prevalent liver disease nowadays and within this uh increased prevalence and increased uh, uh acknowledged of of, import, of 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 importance there is also increasing uh interest in nutrition and lifestyle with regard to nafeld so, since it is very clear that this is the first line treatment and just to show you the evidence of this important, uh, and also to get you familiar with this paper, this is a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease patient guideline, and also guideline for the non-expert physician. I, I really recommend to go over these guidelines if you want to get a good overview of this disease. And what I'm proud of is that a lot of, from a lot, a large part of the, of these uh, papers is actually devoted to nutrition and lifestyle. So this is a main issue in the prevention and treatment of NAFLD. And before we start, I would like to give you some um, basic terms uh, and, and background uh, on alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, so actually, NAFLD includes a wide spectrum of, of liver disease. It includes NAFLD without the D, non-alcoholic fatty liver, without the D because these parts means only hepatic steatosis, only liver fat. And then we can have the more progressive uh, form of the disease called NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And what is interesting about this disease that this separation is not constant, it's not static. And actually patients move all the time from one side to the other. So if they have a healthy lifestyle, they can quite easily, uh, maybe not easily is the right well, uh, word, but reason, with reasonable effort, they can move from NASH to, um, to NAFELD and also vice versa. And within the NAFELD, NAFELD and NASH, we have cirrhotic patients. And unfortunately, unfortunately, I see a lot of them in my uh, liver disease clinic, which can become decompensated and would need liver transplant. And what is really important for me to emphasize that these patients have higher tendency to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, please see that we are used to see ACC in cirrhotic patients. In about 5% of the cirrhotic patients can, in any liver disease, can develop ACC. But in NAFELD, also those without cirrhosis might develop ACC. 
So we need to be aware of that this disease specifically can lead to liver cancer even without the phase of advanced liver disease of cirrhosis. I would discuss shortly also about cirrhosis and prevention in, in this uh, talk. And when we discuss about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, of course, we exclude alcohol consumption, first of all. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not the alcohol, the heavy alcohol abuse that you think of. Actually, it's, it's a very acceptable amount of alcohol that can be considered as a pathotoxic. It's uh, above two drinks per day for a woman and about three drinks per day for men. It's about 20 grams and 30 grams of alcohol per day. But we need to remember that we, even when we exclude alcohol consumption and we discuss non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we need to remember that some patients have both. So sometimes we treat two diseases. Just keep it in mind that alcohol is a big issue to discuss with the patient. So what is interesting that if a patient has both alcoholic, let's say um, 40 grams of, or 30 grams of alcohol per day, Plus obesity, meaning also non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, because non-alcoholic is mostly related with metabolic syndrome and obesity and unhealthy lifestyle, then uh, we, we would have accelerated liver damage. So just keep it in mind that a patient can have actually non-alcoholic, but also alcoholic liver disease. And we need to also remember that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a systematic disease. It's not just hepatic disease, and it's related with, with all organs, and it is related with metabolic imbalance. So it's not surprising that Nafeld is actually related not only with advanced liver disease, but also with increased mortality, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and probably other diseases like uh, kidney problems, um, um, extra hepatic cancers, and so on. And for example, you can see in this uh, meta-analysis that uh, patients with Nafeld have twofold increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Why? Because this is a, a disease with a pathogenesis of insulin resistance and increased hepatic gluconeogenesis. And therefore, it is not only a bystander in type 2 diabetes, it is an actual cause of type 2 diabetes. In addition, if a patient with Nafeld has type 2 diabetes, they would have more advanced liver disease. So this meta-analysis shows us the incidence of advanced liver disease in patients with and without type 2 diabetes. And those with type 2 diabetes will have more liver cirrhosis complications, liver-related mortality, and advanced fibrosis. And as I said, NAFLD is also related with increased cardiovascular risk, about 64% about increased chance of having cardiovascular disease if you have Nafeld as compared to those who don't. These are all prospective cohort studies, of course. So a bit about epidemiology of Nafeld before we move to nutrition. So the global prevalence is presented here. In the Middle East, this is studied by, by my group. Actually, it's, it was part of my PhD. So in a population in, at the age of 50 and above living in the center of Israel, it was about 30%. The prevalence is usually higher among men maybe because of abdominal obesity. And generally, the global prevalence is 25%, but a more recent meta-analysis shows us that the global prevalence is around is, is above 30%, meaning there is increasing prevalence of Nafeld globally. And this is in a general population, not in high-risk population. What happens in high-risk population is this. Um, in obesity, in people suffering from obesity, depending on, on the extent of obesity, 80% would expect it to be to have Nafeld, and in those with type 2 diabetes, about 65% have Nafeld. So these are really major high-risk groups. I must say that also there is something called lean Nafeld or normal weight Nafeld, which is in around... 10 to 15% of people with normal weight, there could be also Nafeld. Usually they have genetic background or they have abdominal obesity or they have gained weight within the, the normal range of weight. But we need to remember that also these people can have Nafeld. And in many times they just don't eat properly. They have a lot of sugar in their diet, so it's worth checking what they eat. 
And I told you this is a very optimistic disease and it, it is reversible by lifestyle in almost all stages. So if either if a person have only steatosis or NASH with and without fibrosis, if they have Mediterranean diet, weight reduction, reduced sugar, reduced saturated fat, they would have a regression of the liver disease. And this is, this is a beautiful disease because you hardly see it in other chronic diseases. Uh, and uh, eventually when a patient uh, reaches the stage of cirrhosis, then it's non-reversible usually, uh, but still there is a lot we can do um, to stop disease progression and also in the prevention of liver cancer, which I will discuss later on. And this is a summary of what we know so far on the lifestyle uh, intervention in uh, Nafeld. So we know there is a dose response association between weight reduction and features of, of uh, Nafeld. Uh, we know that if you reduce small weight, you would improve uh, more features of Nafeld. If you reduce 5%, you would reduce uh, steatosis if you're of your initial body weight. If you reduce 7 to 10% of your initial body weight, you are more likely to reduce also NASH and fibrosis. And if you reduce more than 10%, you are even more likely to reduce fibrosis by at least one uh, stage. And the most important thing in this disease is to reduce fibrosis because fibrosis is eventually the worst thing that can happen to the patients. We say that steatosis is the marker, NASH, the inflammation, is the driver, and, and fibrosis is the killer. Eventually, what kills the patients mostly is the fibrosis stage, okay? But we cannot put all the focus on weight reduction. We know how difficult it is to achieve weight reduction and to keep it in the long term. So we need to find other solutions for our patients. So we must also put a lot of emphasis on the quality of diet, on the dietary composition, and the most studied uh, dietary pattern that is good for Nafeld is the Mediterranean uh, lifestyle plus physical activity, which has an added value over weight reduction in reducing steatosis, NASH, and probably fibrosis. And eventually the whole treatment, the whole lifestyle treatment and medical treatment should be supported by multidisciplinary team, physicians, dietitians, physiologists, uh, psychologists, whatever is needed, and uh, optimistically coordinated by the primary care physician who meets the patients most frequently. And this is a meta-analysis showing the effect of weight reduction in any way, weight reduction in any diet, any option uh, on the features of Nafeld and NASH, and you can see constantly a reduction in steatosis following weight reduction, ALT levels, which is the most specific liver enzyme, and the uh, NAFLD activity score, which is an indicator of NASH. This is a histologic indicator of NASH, of the inflammation. And you can see also constant reduction in this uh, inflammatory score following weight reduction. As for liver fibrosis, it is less consistent. Some studies looking at liver histology show a reduction, some don't. And liver stiffness is a, an excellent measure of liver fibrosis. It is measured by non-invasive methods, which exist in every medical center in Israel, for example, large medical center called FibroScan. And it's, it actually measures liver stiffness as a marker of liver fibrosis. And you can see that following diet, most studies show a reduction in liver stiffness. This is another more recent meta-analysis showing again reduction in hepatic steatosis and also reduction in liver stiffness following different types of diets leading to weight reduction. Now the, the, the idea of 5, 7 and 10% weight reductions comes mostly from this study from Cuba around 200 uh, patients undergoing a very intensive, very comprehensive lifestyle intervention. And they did liver biopsy in, in both uh, the beginning and the end of the 52 week uh, lifestyle intervention. And you can see that if you want to get steatosis improvement in most patients, then 5% weight reduction is sufficient. This is the percent of patients getting improvement. If you want to get natural resolution, complete resolution of the inflammatory state, you need to have, in most patients, you need to have around 7% weight reduction. And if you want a regression of fibrosis by at least one stage, you need 
a weight reduction of at least 10%. However, we know how difficult it is to achieve a 10% weight reduction and to keep it in the long term. So look, also with 5 to 7% weight reduction, some of the patients will improve not only steatosis, but also NASH and fibrosis. So this disease can actually be improved in some patients, even with modest weight reduction and of course, healthy diet. And in the, in the patient guidelines that I mentioned before, so we discussed a lot, not only about weight reduction, we wanted to educate the patients to a healthy lifestyle. So we invested a lot of um, um, efforts to bring the, the best information uh, to the patients. And so the Mediterranean diet is emphasized, physical activity, and, uh, and uh, because I was part of the team, there's also a lot of emphasis on ultra processed food and its harmful effect in uh, Nafel the Natch, and this would be a large part of my talk today. So this is the Mediterranean diet. I'm not going to tell you about it because I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but I want to, to put some things um, to emphasize some points about the Mediterranean diet. So it is a healthy diet. It's, it's a, it is a diet with very little red meat and no processed meat, very little sugar. It is a diet which is, which is actually a reduced carb diet. 40% of the calories come from carbohydrates. Uh, while in a regular diet, it's 50 to 60% of the calories. So it's actually, it's not a low carb diet, but it's a reduced carb diet, okay? And what is also very important to, to notice, this is a diet based on fresh foods, available foods, uh, seasonally available traditional foods, based on culinary activities, meaning home-based cooking. So actually the Mediterranean diet is the polar opposite of the ultra processed food diet. And this is an important point. So let's start with some clinical trials. This is a study conducted in Israel by the group of uh, Professor Iris Shai, showing people who got, uh, this is a very impressive study, almost 300 patients with obesity, 18 months, um, four arms intervention, Mediterranean diet versus low fat diet with and without physical activity. And the bottom line is that the most effective treatment was actually a combination of Mediterranean diet and physical activity. It seems like there is a synergistic effect between Mediterranean diet and physical activity. As you can see in the table below, it was not noted with the low fat diet. So you can see the combination uh, of Mediterranean and, and physical activity led to a synergistic effect in liver fat reduction. And this is actually a um, uh, good opportunity to show it, but it's not surprising. Now, the same group did another uh, study of 18 months, and this time they actually compared two kinds of Mediterranean diets, the green Mediterranean diet and the regular Mediterranean diet. Now, the green Mediterranean diet is characterized by even more reduced consumption of red meat. They hardly ate red meat. They ate more, more walnuts, which are rich in, in omega-3 fatty acids, which are known to reduce liver fat and polyphenols. And they also had other sources of polyphenols as a mankai plant and green tea. And although in both arms of Mediterranean diet, weight reduction was similar, you can see that the, the, the liver fat reduction was almost twofold in the group of the green Mediterranean diet. And this actually emphasizes the importance of dietary composition. So although weight reduction was the same, the addition of omega-3 polyphenol reduction of, of meat, of red meat consumption was related with greater improvement of liver fat. Uh, actually, we in a cross-sectional study in uh, Israeli population also looked at subgroup of polyphenols, phenolic acids, in the diet, we uh, evaluated almost 800 people in Tel Aviv Medical Center, uh, and we looked at, at ultrasound and we looked at fibrosis markers called FibroTest. This is a validated fibrosis marker uh, taken from a blood test. And we looked at phenolic acid content in the food calculated by Phenol Explorer. There is, there is a database with, with phenol content in, in foods. And what we've shown shortly in this study is the 
the higher consumption of phenolic acid is related with less uh, prevalence of NAFLD and less prevalence of liver fibrosis as evaluated by fibrosis uh, markers. You can see foods which are rich in phenolic acids in the picture here uh, below, and you can see that walnuts, fruits, vegetables, coffee, and tea are included. A bit about carbohydrate diet. There are many types of carbo of low carb diets. As I said, Mediterranean diet is actually a reduced carb diet. Uh, but if we if, if we talk about low carb diet, then twenty five percent of the calories coming from from carbs. And then there is the more extreme form of low carb diet, uh, which is the keto diet, of course, with less than five percent of the calories coming from carbohydrates. Uh, Actually, um, this meta-analysis showed that there is no difference in the efficacy between low-fat diet and low-carb diet in the treatment of NAFLD. It's only a matter of how much weight reduction they get. When you follow them for a couple of days, then you see that the low-carb diet may be more efficient. But when you keep following them, the patients, for a couple of weeks, you see that what actually uh, uh, sets the, the amount of liver fat reduction is actually the weight reduction. So it doesn't matter how it is um, achieved. As for the keto diet, there is very, very little uh, evidence, very short term, um, small trials. So I didn't get into it um, in this uh, in this talk, but we can discuss it in the end. Um, a bit about uh, intermittent fasting. Uh, intermittent fasting, uh, it's a very nice way to treat the patients. Actually, many patients feel very comfortable with it. Um, uh, it has been, uh, there, first of all, there are several um, forms of intermittent fasting. There is no one form. There is the alternate day fasting, you kind of fast one day and feast one day. There is the 5-2 diet, five days you eat whatever you want, but generally healthy. And two days, it's uh, just 500 calories. And there is the time-restricted eating, the 8-16 restriction or other more severe restrictions on the time that a person can eat. All of them has been uh, demonstrated to have some beneficial effect on the metabolic syndrome, blood pressure, and so on. Um, they generally lead to uh, weight reduction, uh, but it's inconclusive whether the intermittent fasting method is better than the usual diet in terms of weight reduction or metabolic improvement. Uh, it is still debated. I think that eventually the patients can choose whatever they feel comfortable with. In terms of NAFO, there is very little evidence. This uh, short-term uh, study uh, of 12 weeks compared a alter alternate day fasting and time restricted uh, fasting, the two diets, versus a control diet, uh, with, which was not without intervention. And they showed that both um, um, intermittent fasting uh, methods uh, led to similar uh, body weight reduction and quite similar uh, reduction in fat mass. And uh, disappointingly, none of them has led to significant improvement in liver stiffness measured by uh, FibroScan. But the point is that it was safe. And so patients can actually um, do it if they feel that it's more comfortable to them. Uh, and this is a bit uh, more interesting study uh, to me because uh, they compared um, the 5-2 uh, diet as compared to low carb diet. Uh, in NAFL patients as compared to um, control. Uh, and this was again a short term study of 12 weeks in 74 patients. Uh, and you can see that patients indeed changed their diet in the low carb diet, they really reduced the carb in intake and increased the, the fat intake. But eventually in 12 weeks, they reduced um, uh, body weight to a similar extent, about seven and a half kilograms and reduce the amount of liver fat to a similar extent. What does it mean? It means that intermittent fasting is no better than a regular diet, but it is really another option. Again, I'm looking at, at, the, at, the, at the optimistic side of this story that patient can really choose to do this diet. It is safe and it is at least as good as a regular diet. 
Now, we talked a lot about weight reduction, and I really want to move talking about dietary composition. This is what I believe in most, not, not focusing all the treatment on weight reduction, but rather keep weight reduction as part of the treatment, but not the only uh, measure of success. So let's, uh, let's look at dietary patterns. These are observational studies showing that a Western dietary pattern rich in ultra processed food, for example, is related with increased risk of NAFLD, while healthy types of diet, including Mediterranean diet, are related with reduced prevalence of NAFLD. And this is another study looking specifically at food groups. This is a meta-analysis. Again, I show a lot of meta-analysis because there's a lot of literature to, to, that we should summarize. So red meat is actually related with increased risk of having uh, NAFELD. Soft drinks are related even with a greater risk of having NAFELD, 30% greater risk of having NAFELD. And at that point of my talk, people usually start saying, okay, but so we can't eat anything, we can't drink anything. But that's not true because if you look here at the, at the gray zone uh, of this figure, these are all foods that are either harmful uh, or good, but they can be eaten uh, regularly by patients with NAFL without any special uh, prob problem, of course. Fish may, may be even protective because they can be rich in omega-3 fatty acids. You can see that walnuts are protective. And you can see in the orange, the harmful foods, which is red meat, processed meat, and soft drinks. Let's talk a little bit about sugar and, and, and soft drinks. There's a lot of evidence showing the harmful effects of sugar and soft drinks in Nuffield. And th these are, this is a very short summary of two beautiful studies actually among children, because the talk is in adults, so I presented children's studies very shortly. Uh, this is a study showing that infants at the age of one year who consume two or more be uh, sugar beverages, it can be also fruit juice and food concentrates, are uh, threefold more likely to have NAFLD at the age of 10 year old, regardless of body weight. Okay, this is an American study. And another study, Italian study, which is pretty amazing, this uh, Italian study below uh, actually showed that children with, with um, who, who about 200 children underwent liver biopsy. Okay, this is a very rare. Uh, uh, study and they showed that if they consume a lot of fructose in their diet, they have one and a half fold to have not only NAFLD but to have NASH, to have the more advanced form of liver disease. It was strongly and independently, regardless of BMI, related with having more advanced liver disease among children. Okay. Let's move to adults. This is just one example of many. This study is uh, it's a large prospective cohort study. This is why I chose it. Shows us that if you have four serving per week, not so much per week of sugar beverages, you would have about 50% increased chance of developing um, NAFLD. And there is a dose response association between the amount of soft drinks, sugar soft drinks and NAFLD. Now, there's always the question, which is worse, glucose or fructose or, or both? And this beautiful study actually looked at um, fructose, sucrose and glucose. Now, you know that sucrose contains both glucose and fructose, right? Uh, so they took healthy men with normal weight and they provided them for seven weeks sugar beverages containing either one of these sugars. And what they have shown that only the fructose containing drinks, the fructose and the sucrose led to significant increased uh, hepatic de novo lipogenesis. Okay, only those fructose containing drink actually increase the amount of liver fat. So I'm not saying that glucose is fine, but definitely fructose is the major uh, problem when it comes to liver disease. What about fat? So there, this is a beautiful review from Nature shows us that repeatedly uh, feeding studies, uh, which last from a couple of weeks, uh, usually a usually couple of weeks, um, which provided patients uh, or healthy people with overload 
of either saturated fat or isocaloric amount of unsaturated fat cons constantly show that only saturated fat increase the amount of liver fat, not polyunsaturated fat, although the, the, the caloric uh, intake was the same. So saturated fat is not good for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and we can discuss it further in the discussion, um, the, the meaning of it, for example, for the ketogenic diet. So I, in this uh, review we published this year, I try to summarize what are, what are the most evidence-based diet and, and what are the things that should, we should always remember when, it, when we treat patients. So Mediterranean diet is in green, it's the most evidence diet in Nuffield. And then we have the low fat and the low carb diet, which are e equally evidence-based. And then we have the less evidence-based diet, the time-restricted eating and the ketogenic diet that is, has no evidence almost, at least in Nuffield. Uh, and the point is this figure is that patients can choose the diet they want. You discuss with the patient, you learn what they eat, you learn what they want, and you try to tailor the diet to their needs and preferences. But whatever you do, if you choose a ketogenic diet, if you choose a low carb diet, please stay within the guidelines of Mediterranean diet. Please try to keep the dietary composition the closest as you can to Mediterranean diet, meaning don't provide a patient with low carb diet, which is super rich with saturated fat, okay? Because we don't know then if this diet won't have long-term harmful effects. So whatever you do, keep it within the guidelines of Mediterranean diet. And even if you do time-restricted eating, you can do time-restricted eating with any of these diets, you need to keep these principles. And what is most important is that the, these foods below should be kept out. The ultra processed food, the processed meat, saturated fat, sugar, and mostly sugar beverages should always be kept out because there is a, a significance of the dietary composition, not only the weight reduction. So we recommend the patients to have Mediterranean diet, how nice of us, but in practice, they need to face these foods on the right. And in fact, the population consumes huge amounts of ultra processed food, sugar and saturated fat. So ultra processed food is actually uh, a major source of sh added sugar, the, the sugar that, that is actually related with harmful effects. When I talk about sugar, I don't talk, I don't talk about eating uh, fruits and vegetables, okay? I'm not talking about the natural sugar. I'm talking about the added sugar. And by the way, uh, fruit juice are included in the added sugar because it's not, once you squeeze it and put it in a bottle, it's not, it's not a fruit anymore, right? It is something else. So this is the ultra processed food is a major source of added sugar and saturated fat and other unhealthy uh, compounds. And in fact, 50 to 60% of the total calories in many Western countries comes from ultra processed foods. And ultra processed food is not only sugar and fat, it's also other things because we have the colors, we have things that are, are formed unintentionally within the food preparation in the food industry. For example, when food is prepared in the industry with a lot of sugar and in very high temperatures, um, then we have formation of advanced glycation and products, which are glycotoxins, and I will discuss it um, uh, in a few slides. So nobody intends to create them, but they are formed in industrial foods. Uh, and for and another example is the bisphenol A because because ultra processed foods comes in packages and these packages are in contact with the food and so all kinds of compounds move to the food and we eventually eat them and the BPA is a good example and I will show you in a minute so ultra processed food is is a whole world of not only nutrients but also compounds and other things that are unintentionally found in the foods. This is the consumption of ultra processed food in different countries. Just see how big is the consumption among children and adolescents. This is just unbelievable. Okay, so ultra processed food, it, it's like not a real food, mostly because it is very synthetic. It's, it underwent a lot of industrialized processes. And the meaning is with ultra processed food is that it is very far 
from the original foods it was made of. So if you take a schnitzel in the form of a, of a dinosaur, right? It wasn't like that in nature. So a lot of things happened to turn it to a form of a dinosaur. Or if you take a cereal with all kinds of morning cereals, with all kinds of colors, it is very far from the grains it was made of, right? So the ultra processed food has gone a lot of processes that you would never do in your kitchen using ingredients that you would never use in your kitchen, like palm oil and all kinds of hydrolyzed proteins and high fructose corn syrup and colors. These are things that you don't use in your kitchen. You would find in the list of, of ingredients in ultra processed food. It is designed to be hyper palatable and therefore increases obesity. There are many studies showing increased obesity with the consumption of ultra processed food. And it is designed to be highly profitable, to have long shelf life and, and again, to induce consumption. And of course, it usually, usually not always, but usually has low nutritional quality. So we looked in an Israeli population at the association of ultra processed food and metabolic syndrome and significant fibrosis by fibrosis markers. This is the same population that I've showed you before on polyphenol studies. Now we evolved and uh, analyzed the data on nutrition by the NOVA classification. This is the most acceptable classification of ultra processed food. And what we, you can see here is a dose response association between the percent of consumption of ultra processed food from calories and the presence of metabolic syndrome among NAFO patients. Why is it important? Because the more NAFO patients have metabolic syndrome, the more the liver disease is progressive. They are more likely to develop advanced fibrosis. And another thing we found that there is an interaction between smoking and high consumption of ultra processed food. If a patient ever smoked and eats a lot of ultra processed food he is more likely to have advanced fibrosis. Okay, according to fibrosis markers, of course, it's a cross sectional studies with a limitation of a cross sectional studies. So, of course, these results need to be confirmed in prospective studies. And here, here it is. A prospective study of 16,000 people, uh, NAFLD was diagnosed by abdominal ultrasound. And in this prospective cohort, which adjusted for all other risk factors, including body mass index and physical activity and other nutritional factors, they show clearly a dose response association between ultra processed food consumption and the incidence of non alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, Part of the ultra processed food is ultra processed meat and part of the Western diet or the opposite of Mediterranean diet is a high consumption of red meat. So we have a lot of focus around this topic. And in this case control study, we have looked at the American uh, population from the United States from the multi ethnic uh, cohort, huge sample size case control study. Um, and we looked at NAFELD with and without cirrhosis, meaning just NAFELD or patients with really advanced liver disease. And what we've shown in this study is that high consumption above the fourth quartile of consumption of red meat is related with NAFELD with cirrhosis. Processed meat was related with, related with NAFELD. Poultry was also related, but I must say that uh, in most studies, poultry is not related with NAFELD. Uh, and col high cholesterol intake was related with NAFLD with cirrhosis and not surprisingly, maybe high fiber intake was actually a protective factor from NAFLD. So you can see how it correlates very nicely with the concept of Mediterranean diet. And again, we are back to, to our population, the Israeli cohort that we have at the Tel Aviv Medical uh, Center in collaboration with the University of Haifa. And actually the same study population that I presented earlier, we did a follow-up uh, on this population of about seven year follow-up on average. And we asked them to come again and do the same test that they did before. And so we defined uh, the group that had either instant new onset of NAFELD or persistent NAFELD, meaning they had NAFELD both in the baseline and then again in the seven uh, year follow up. And we compared them to people who had remission of NAFELD 
or never had Nafod in any of the surveys. And what we found that high uh, consumption of meat at baseline was related with greater incidence or persistence of Nafod. But when we looked further at the meat typed, we saw that the association was, wasn't with poultry, it was only with red and processed meat, which actually were related with incident or persistent Nafod. Moreover, in the follow-up study, we had FibroScan, which is a very good tool, as I said, to measure fibrosis. So we looked at significant fibrosis by the FibroScan, and we, sh we uh, could see that red and processed meat consumption is also related with a greater chance of having significant fibrosis at follow-up. And again, this is supported by pro large prospective cohort studies. This is a nurse's health study, almost 80,000 uh, women. Red and processed meat consumption were related with, um, with NAFELD. Um, and uh, it was also true for processed and unprocessed uh, red meat. You can see the, the, um, the association measures uh, here. Uh, and what, is, what this study adds is actually that they did a mediation analysis and they looked at the mediating factors and they have shown that heme iron, which is found in meat, mostly red meat, cholesterol and BMI were significant mediating factors explaining the association between red and processed meat consumption and NAFOD. And this is another study looking at liver related mortality this time, not specifically NAFOD. But what I like about this study is again that they looked at different compounds within meat that can explain the association. And they showed it that red meat is related with NAFOD, while white meat, which is poultry and fish, is, is actually protective from NAFOD. But what they did further is that they looked at nitrate within processed meat. And they have shown that the amount of nitrate within processed meat is actually a predictor of liver-related mortality. So this adds some knowledge to explain why uh, processed meat is related with liver disease. We also looked in, in our uh, study at meat consumption. We also looked not only at meat consumption, we also asked, how do you prepare the meat? Do you make it very well done? Do you put it on a open fire? Do you fry it? Do you cook it? Do you boil it? So we looked at meat preparation methods and what we found that the meat preparation method called unhealthy, meaning grilling uh, to a level of very well done or frying is related with increased consumption of heterocyclic amines, which are known to be carcinogenic compounds, but it's also related with insulin resistance. And we also show that it is related with greater consumption of advanced glycation end products, as I mentioned before. Advanced glycation end products are actually glycotoxins. This is a reaction between usually sugar, protein, or fat. Um, and it, is, it happens, it is accelerated. This reaction is accelerated under a high heat uh, cooking and it is accelerated when the food contains more uh, fat and more sugar, either one or both. So let's say if you put meat in the oven in high temperatures with dried fruits or some honey, then you actually uh, create the optimal way to form advanced glycation end products. You get a beautiful browning, everything is tasty, looks great, right? Don't feel bad, I do it too. But just know that this browning has a price and it actually means that the food contains more advanced glycation and products. And the more the food is processed, we also create them at home, but the more there is processing of the food, the greater is usually the content of advanced glycation and products in the foods. And so uh, we, we digest these compounds and some are retained in the body and lead to um, Oxidative stress, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes are related with NAFLD, NASH, and liver cancer. This is based on several uh, studies. You can see the references, some of them at least, um, below. If you want to reduce ages consumption in your diet, not surprisingly, eat Mediterranean diet, right? Uh, and, and also eat food that is cooked. Uh, we call it um, wet cooking, so you actually boil it 
like like you put a chicken in a soup instead of putting it in the oven so it doesn't get the brown nice color but it's, it's it contains less uh, less ages um and uh okay we don't have time to get into the receptors of advanced glycation and products but if you are interested to know there are, there are also good receptors for advanced glycation decoy receptors which we found that if you exercise more if you don't smoke and if you eat less processed meat you are more likely to have the protective kind of receptors which actually protect you from advanced glycation and products it's called soluble receptor for advanced location and products. So if you plan today for dinner uh, to have uh, either pasta or uh, meat cooked uh, to um, at least to a level of well done. So you can see the amount of calories is, is quite similar, but you can see that the amount of advanced location and products is very different, right? So red meat, you, you you do bring it to a level of well done or very well done and you have a huge amount of ages for dinner um now everything that i said so far about nafeld is also true for the prevention of hepatocellular carcinoma it is amazing so this is actually a summary that we did in, in a paper from seminars of liver disease well, we took only large prospective cohort studies or meta-analysis of prospective cohort studies and we uh, summarize uh, the relation with lifestyle and nutrition. So Mediterranean diet and fish and poultry and unprocessed meat are related with reduced risk of, of liver cancer, while red and processed meat and sugar and sugar beverages are related with increased risk of liver cancer. Coffee, as I mentioned previously, would we, when we discuss uh, polyphenols, is constantly related with reduced risk of liver cancer. So we actually, it's not a formal guideline, but we actually tell patients they can drink coffee, you know, three, four cups per day, if they feel good with it, then it might uh, prevent liver cancer. High fat dairy products increase liver cancer while, while low fat dairy products uh, and vegetable fat and fiber reduce the, the, the um, risk of liver cancer. So everything we say to the patients may also help prevent liver cancer. Uh, a bit about the, the food packing and its relation to uh, nafoto. I mentioned before the bisphenol A, the BPA. BPA is actually an endocrine disrupting chemical, which means it is it leads to insulin resistant and is related with type 2 diabetes. Um, cardiovascular disease and liver abnormalities. It is the building block of plastics and the leaning of food and beverages containers. So you can see below the picture of, of where you can find it. And it actually disrupts the pancreatic beta cells function and whole body glucose homostasis. So, but if you want to have a BPA free diet, you can, you can do it. You just need to avoid foods that comes in bottles and cans and not to put in the microwave plastic um, boxes and, and so on. So it's actually very doable to have a BPA free or almost free diet. And in this study, they looked at 60 NAFO patients with liver biopsies and they show us that uh, they, they divide the, the um, severity of liver disease uh, in terms of inflammation, which they looked at liver biopsy, and they show us that the more you have uh, bisphenol A, uh, higher um, uh, serum bisphenol A levels, the greater you have uh, liver damage, okay? Of course, you can't conclude on, on causal relationship, it's a cross-sectional study, but it's still very interesting. And they also show us that when you compare control to patients with only steatosis, with NAFLD, and patients with NASH, with more advanced form of liver disease, then you can see that plasma and urine levels of the most severe liver disease patients, at least the, the plasma levels are higher. So BPA levels are higher among NASH patients. With urine, uh, you, can, you can see um, um, uh, greater BPA levels as compared to controls, but there is no difference between NAFO and NASH. And then finally, they did a BPA-free diet for one month, and you can see that the levels in the serum, at least, were uh, reduced within one month. So you can actually reduce your serum BPA levels if you have a BPA-free diet. 
and maybe just maybe it would also have a beneficial effect in effort but it still needs to be demonstrated we don't have much time to discuss exercise but i'm just going to show you two meta analyses showing constantly that uh, physical activity even without weight reduction leads to reduction of liver fat leads to reduction of liver enzymes and so we just need to remember that every time we provide lifestyle recommendations we should also discuss patients about even very moderate physical activity has beneficial effect in um, NAFELD. Uh, sitting time is also important. This is adjusted for physical activity. So if people sit more than eight hours a day, regardless of the amount of physical activity that they do, this is a large cross-sectional study, they still have increased risk of having NAFELD. So increase physical activity and sit if you can, uh, uh, following this talk, uh, take a good walk, it would be perfect. Okay. What is the, what is the ideal regimen for physical activity? Obviously, we want patients to combine both resistance and aerobic physical activity, but actually they are equally beneficial. And if patients find it difficult to do aerobic physical activity, they can also do re resistance exercise. And about three times a week, 45 minutes, would uh, significantly reduce the amount of liver fat, even without weight reduction. Alcohol is related with increased risk of severe liver events, uh, greater progression of fibrosis, NASH, and liver cancer in these uh, patients. This is all prospective, high-quality studies summarized in this um, table. Of course, we talk about very, very moderate, modest alcohol consumption. We talk about one, or, or less, let's say less than two drinks per day, which is very normative consumption, right? But even this consumption is harmful for NAFL patients, so they shouldn't drink at all. Um, there is also a very impressive interaction between alcohol consumption and obesity, abdominal obesity, and type 2 diabetes. So. If you look at these epidemiological studies, the summary of them, you can see that even with a very modest weight reduction, if a person has obesity or type 2 diabetes, their, their risk of having severe liver event, hospitalization, death, liver cancer, dramatically increases much more uh, than those without obesity or type 2 diabetes. So there is a very clear and strong interaction and synergistic effect between obesity type 2 diabetes and even very very modest alcohol consumption in leading to severe liver damage so the guidance for alcohol cannot be the same for people who suffer from obesity and type 2 diabetes another thing is that even very light alcohol consumption among patients with NAFELD is related with increased risk of type 2 diabetes Patients without NAFEL who have modest alcohol consumption do not develop diabetes. But a patient with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with very modest consumption dramatically increases the risk of having type 2 diabetes. And so the guidelines of the more recent guidelines from 2019 to 2022 uh, constantly recommend patients to avoid alcohol or at least to minimize. And if they have advanced fibrosis, they should avoid alcohol completely because any amount of alcohol is related with increased risk of liver cancer. We, I will finish in a, in a minute, Ronnie, but I, I want to uh, make it to say everything that I wanted, but this was expected. Sure. Uh, smoking is also related with NAFELD. It can be uh, passive smoking, formal smoking. This is an umbrella review of meta-analysis uh, of uh, observational studies and randomized clinical trials showing association with smoking, again, association with sugar and association with red meat. Uh, smoking is related with increased risk of fibrosis and also very, it is a very, very important risk factor for liver cancer. This is a summary of meta-analysis of prospective cohort studies showing a very strong association between smoking and risk of liver cancer. Um, I, I wanted just to say in one word that there is a strong association between NAFELD and socioeconomic deprivation. So people from low socioeconomic status have more NAFELD, and some studies asked why. 
And one of the reasons is that people from lower socioeconomic part of the society have lower diet quality and have a greater food insecurity. So meaning they don't necessarily feel hunger, but they can't afford buying the healthy foods that they need. So when we treat NAFL, we also need to consider these factors of socioeconomic status and what the patients can afford buying. Now, it is very difficult to make lifestyle modifications, very difficult to convince patients to have changes, especially when, there is the, 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 when we have the obesogenic environment. And now there are many pills and surgeries to treat obesity, but we always need to remember two things. First of all, pills and surgeries won't work without dietary modification in the long term, so we need to do both. And another thing is that we need all together, all of us, all the profession, all the health professionals work together and change the environment to make the healthier choices, the easier choices. I, f I end all my talks in, in this sentence, and I think it is a very important message. Uh, we need to work together to convince the food industry to provide us with better food, to reformulate the food, to put food labeling, which would be obligatory, like, the, like we have in Israel, uh, to have the sugar beverages tax uh, going because it is really important. And of course, a lot of education, especially among children and especially among populations from low socioeconomic uh, status. And if you want to read more about it, I highly recommend um, this is a last commission uh, paper we published, which really covers everything you want to know about non-alcoholic fat liver disease, including policies to improve nutrition. And with that, thank you so much uh, for listening. Thank you very much, Ira. And with this message, I want to start our discussion. So... If you can please uh, do stop share so we can see everybody. And I have some questions from the chat written. i just uh, put you off spotlight. Okay, thank you. So uh, very vast knowledge from different angles of lifestyle habits, which was great. And I embraced um, the message of changing our environment and make the healthy choice easiest, which this is our obligation as professionals and joining hands to do so. So I've written six uh, topics and questions from the chat. So I'll start with, um, do you know of any long-term studies of over three to five years, especially about low carb diets? No, there is, there is none. This is no. so disappointing, I know. Also, I can tell you that most studies looked at liver steatosis as outcome because it's the easiest thing to look at in, in imaging, but we hardly have information on fibrosis and NASH. The most evidence we have is from the study that I showed you from Cuba who had liver biopsies. So now, unfortunately, there is one study on Mediterranean diet of two year follow-up showing it's um, better than low fat diet but this is the longest study and definitely no keto studies uh, with that uh, follow-up okay uh, another question is regarding weight or bmi uh, although you show that the there is much more than bmi in uh, neffold um, is there a difference between a bmi of 19 or 25 which we know both are in the range of um so we, we, I said that we, there is a term of normal weight or so-called lean NAFL, which is actually the BMI below 25. Um, but when you, it's not only the BMI, we need to remember that the most important thing is, is the body fat distribution. So visceral fat is the most important, right? Because it, it is most strongly related with metabolic alterations and, and NAFL. So you can have a person with a BMI of 24, but it, with a lot of visceral fat. And you can mm -hmm. have another person with the same BMI with little visceral fat. And what studies have shown that if you take controls, normal weight controls and compare them to normal weight NAFL patients, then definitely those with NAFL have a greater visceral fat. So it's not a matter of exactly of the BMI, it's a matter of what yeah. the fat is. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is regarding microbiome. If you have any note on that? 
So yeah, there are. I'm 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 smiling because I have now an ongoing study <laughs> on microbiome, and I'm I'm really new in this field, so I I don't have much to say. I'm really studying while doing the research. Uh, there are, there are some studies uh, showing an association between different species and 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 Nuffield. Uh, what is really missing is more knowledge on the association between nutrition microbiome and Nuffield, and this is exactly the goal of my ongoing study. So hopefully a year or two from now, I would have a, a more interesting uh, answer to, to share with you. So we'll have another webinar. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, another question is related to the plant-based alternatives. If, if you think they're mostly or some of our ultra-processed foods, and how the, do they affect Nuffield? So I'll start from the end. There is no evidence looking at, at plant-based alter alternatives uh, um, uh, on, on Nuffield. There is no such uh, study. Um, and I think it's very difficult to do such a study because they, if you do epidemiological study, then not enough people consume these foods and then you can not have statistical power to show an association. So I think it would have to be some kind of an interventional study to show if there is a relation with Nuffield. Uh, we do know that some of these alternatives are ultra processed foods. So I can't tell patients this is uh, completely healthy. You can have it every day. So what I recommend patients uh, who look for a plant-based alternative is to um, have a tofu, to have legumes, um, to go more on the fresh foods they, that they can prepare at home and less on the things that they buy in the supermarket in, in boxes. Same as my recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, Two more questions were on the chat. One was regarding a plant called, I hope I pronounce it right, Silibum marianum, yes. which is Gdilan Matsui. Yes, yes, Silibin. Uh, so, uh, so yes, or, or milk cistel, which is the compound you extract from it. But uh, the, no, I'm sorry, the milk cistel is, is the name of the plant. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a very ancient plant medication for liver disease from the 16th, 13th century, I think. It's a very ancient um, uh, compound. Um, there are some studies uh, looking at clinical trials, looking at this effect of pills of this compound uh, um, on Nuffield and Nash. Unfortunately, they are not very high quality. Usually they are done by the same uh, few groups. Uh, and um, Therefore, they are not included in any of the guidelines, not the European or the American. Any of the guidelines uh, does not include anything about these uh, compounds. There is no recommendation. Uh, I don't mind that patients will take it if they want to. Uh, it's usually safe, but I really can prom can't promise uh, them anything. We don't have enough high quality evidence. Okay, and last one that I read was regarding the relationship between insulin resistance and NAFLD. And the question is, is are they both results of the same uh, uh, situation of excess fat mass? I, I guess there are many reasons. Uh, what, what is the result of NAFLD and what is the result of insulin resistance? There is also the genetic background, uh, of course. There is the, the nutrients that you eat. There is the obesity and the type of obesity uh, that you have. But what is most interesting is that um, NAFLD is a result of insulin resistance, but it also increases the insulin resistance. And once you have uh, fat within liver cells, within the hepatocytes, then you have a specific localized insulin resistance. You have hepatic insulin resistance, which is specific to the liver. And that means that the, um, the um, ability of insulin to, to reduce gluconeogenesis is actually harmed, is actually reduced. And that leads to increase, increased gluconeogenesis, hepatic gluconeogenesis. And then the, the pancreas uh, secretes more and more insulin, but within the years, we know that it can't uh, exert, exert anymore, and then we have the beginning of type 2 diabetes, right? And so what is amazing here that actually liver uh, fat is very active in the formation or, or, or in making the severity of insulin resistance greater and in the formation of type 2 diabetes. 
I think mm -hmm. this is the most uh, um, amazing and interesting association uh, for us to realize in, in within the context of this talk. Okay, and now on the chat, someone's asking about coffee. Um, um, how yeah. do you explain the effect of coffee? So probably very, very strong uh, polyphenols, probably because when you look at, at decaf coffee, it is also protective, although there are less studies, I must say, but it seems also to be protective and it seems that the most significant um, uh, are, are polyphenol, uh, antioxidant, antifibrotic, anticarcinogenic compounds within the coffee. There are actually Great. very good reviews uh, on this topic. Thank you, Shira. Any other questions before we wrap it up and say thank you very much for this very important information for us as professionals. So I would like to thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>